Hello, my name is George Mexicano and I'm a professor of medicine and a senior associate dean for education at Oregon Health and Science University. Today I'm going to be making a presentation on outpatient antibiotic selection. So there are lots of ways for people to consider and think about antibiotics. And one of the best ways um, is to put them in different categories based upon their mechanisms of action. Uh, there are many, many different antibiotics, uh, but there are relatively few areas of um, where they actually work in, in the bacterial cells. And uh, that's depicted on this slide. Uh, so you can see starting from the upper left, uh, that some uh, agents are active against the cell wall or upper right cell membrane. Um, uh, others um, are uh, uh, effective against protein synthesis in the bottom right. Um, some work against metabolic uh, pathways, particularly the uh, 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 sulfa antimicrobials, and then uh, a few work against um, or work on uh, nucleic acid uh, and replication. Um, so that's one way to think about this, and we're going to go through some slides that categorize antibiotics um, in such categories. Uh, so uh, target, uh, antibiotics that target the cell wall include um, all the beta-lactams, that includes the cephalosporins, um, as well as the carbapenems, um, things like imipenem, for example. Uh, then there are the glycopeptides, um, uh, and the most important one in the United States uh, is vancomycin. Um, Bacitracin is a, is a topical drug that many of you are familiar with. Um, there are um, some of the tuberculosis drugs like uh, isoniazid um, uh, also work there. Um, and then there's an unusual drug uh, that is used primarily for patients with a lot of allergies um, or who have a lot of adverse drug reactions for urinary tract infections, and that's a drug called phosphomycin. So those are examples of, of antibiotics that work against the cell wall. Um, uh, in contrast, uh, there are some that work against cell membranes, and you can see the group here. Um, polymyxin is a topical drug. Colistin is a drug that's rarely used, um, uh, but it has had a niche against pseudomonas. Um, and then uh, the one that's most commonly used now in the inpatient side um, is daptomycin, which is a cyclic lipopeptide. It basically causes depolarization of the cell membrane. As I mentioned earlier, the, um, it's primarily the sulfa antimicrobials uh, that are active against metabolic pathways, and particularly the folate synthesis pathway. So trimethoprim, um, all of the sulfa um, antimicrobials, and then pyrimethamine, which is primarily used against toxoplasmosis. Now switching from, the, if you will, the shell, uh, the outer coating of the bacteria, uh, and towards the ribosomes, um, there are uh, a number of, of different antibiotic groupings that um, target protein synthesis. Uh, and bacteria generally have, are thought to have um, uh, two subunits of their ribosomes, the 30S ribosome and the 50S ribosome. Um, agents that are active against the 30S ribosome include um, the aminoglycosides, such as gentamicin and tobramycin, as well as the entire tetracycline fa family, so that includes um, minocycline and doxycycline. Uh, active against the 50S ribosome uh, include all the macrolides, so uh, azithromycin, erythromycin, clarithromycin, uh, and clindamycin. Uh, Chlorophenicol is a historical drug that uh, is no longer used uh, in the U.S. And then finally, um, right where protein synthesis is initiated um, is the uh, target, if you will, of uh, linazolid, which is uh, in a family called the oxazolidinones, and, but that is a protein synthesis active agent. And then uh, finally, there are uh, antibiotics that um, target um, either the structure or the function around replication uh, and the nucleic acids, and that includes uh, the fluoroquinolones, uh, so levofloxacin, moxifloxacin, ciprofloxacin, um, all the rifampin drugs and, and its analogs, and then finally, um, the imidazoles, and the most important one there is metronidazole. So it gives you a way to think about antibiotics in, uh, in terms of where you target. And when and one of the, the uh, best practices is that when you um, have to use two drugs um, because you're worried about resistance or you're worried about um, uh, the, a broad, uh, different organisms that, um, that uh, um, uh, may not be covered by one antibiotic, what you typically want to use is drugs that target two different uh, areas of the bacterial cell. So that's just a broad overview. 
Um, now let's talk about sort of the thought process that hopefully all of you use and consider when you're selecting an antibiotic and uh, the focus of today's talk is on the outpatient side. So you have a patient in the clinic or perhaps in urgent care uh, and you're trying to, uh, you've made a decision that you want to use uh, an, an antibiotic because you think it's a bacterial infection and you um, uh, are trying to figure out which one to use. Well, here are some care, uh, some aspects of the drugs that you might want to consider. Uh, so we're going to go through each of these uh, in turn, starting with penetration uh, and absorption. Well, there are some drugs that uh, are known to uh, uh, be absorbed uh, to a very high degree, and typically those same drugs penetrate into the areas that you need to get the drug into uh, quite well. So this is the, the, the group of antibacterial uh, agents that have excellent absorption uh, and generally have excellent uh, penetration. So the good news is that there's, um, they're very useful antibiotics. So the fluoroquinolone, so again, levofloxacin, moxifloxacin, ciprofloxacin, um, all of them are very well absorbed. Um, the issue that you want to be careful about uh, is that their absorption is, di is diminished um, if they're concomitantly taken um, with uh, uh, anything that has minerals, and particularly divalent and trivalent uh, cations. Um, so the classic one is um, someone taking ciprofloxacin um, and they drink, um, they swallow the pill uh, with a glass of milk. Well, the calcium in the milk uh, will uh, basically chelate to the fluoroquinolone and that chelation uh, basically does not allow the, the drug to get absorbed. And so the rule of thumb is that you should avoid um, um, dairy products uh, and any um, uh, uh, food or supplement um, that has uh, calcium, magnesium, um, zinc, aluminum, um, uh, things along the, that, that nature. And the classic ones for that, of course, are the antacids. Uh, but even a multivitamin with calcium is something you should avoid, um, um, again, taking at the same time as a fluoroquinolone. So the, what we tell patients is if you're going to take a fluoroquinolone uh, and you really like dairy products, for example, or you need to take your calcium supplement, um, separate that by at least two hours. Uh, and I literally, I literally tell patients, um, it's great to have a glass of milk in the morning with breakfast at 8 o'clock, take the pill at 10 a.m., um, and then you can have a, something like a yogurt or some other dairy product, maybe a sandwich with cheese um, at noon. But that two-hour separation before and after the pill is important for absorption. One other um, um, aspect I want to uh, harp on with the fluoroquinolones is uh, how well they are absorbed. And I'll use levofloxacin as the example. The IV formulation and the oral formulation are the exact same dose, 500 milligrams daily. Um, so it's basically 100% absorption if you avoid the divalent cations. Um, uh, in contrast, ciprofloxacin is 80% uh, absorbed. Uh, and the um, a way that I remember that is that the intravenous formulation is 400 milligrams IV uh, Q12 hours, uh, while the oral formulation is 500 milligrams uh, PO twice daily. So 80% um, of the oral dose uh, is uh, absorbed, um, but that's still excellent uh, and is very useful in terms of outpatient antimicrobial therapy. Metronidazole is essentially 100% absorbed as well. The biggest issue there, of course, is that it has a gunmetal uh, taste, and so patients really don't like um, that very much. Um, so uh, uh, a couple of tricks that you for you to um, counsel your patients about um, if you're going to uh, uh, prescribe metronidazole uh, is that peanut butter I have found uh, is the one food product that that masks the taste pretty well. The second, of course, is to try to avoid the tongue when swallowing. So, I, so if the patient has enough coordination, um, I literally say if you can throw the pill sort of you know at the back to the back of your oral pharynx uh, and avoid the the, the uh, anterior half of the tongue, then generally the taste will, will be much uh, better. Uh, uh, that are much easier to tolerate. Uh, clindamycin also has excellent absorption, essentially 100%, um, but of course that's uh, notorious because of its association with antibiotic-associated diarrhea and of course uh, Clostridium difficile uh, infection. Uh, linazolid um, is uh, also very well absorbed. The, the intravenous dose and the IV dose are exactly the same. Um, the issue there um, uh, was that for a long time, linazolid was very expensive. It's gone down somewhat uh, in price. And the other thing is if you use linazolid for more than a week, you really should be monitoring um, uh, 
for uh, bone marrow toxicity with a CBC uh, because you can drop the, the blood counts quite um, uh, dramatically. Uh, doxycycline uh, and um, uh, its cousins are also uh, well absorbed. Uh, again, the IV dose of doxycycline is exactly the same as the oral dose. Uh, the issue there is photosensitivity. It can cause um, uh, basically um, um, a pretty bad reaction if someone is on doxycycline and goes out and, and uh, spends time in the sun. Uh, it'll, yeah, you can get a, a pretty bad sunburn even in winter because of that reaction. Uh, not everybody, of course, uh, has that issue, uh, but it's something to, to tell patients about. And then finally, rifampin, again, the IV formulation is the same as the oral formulation. Um, and uh, I, I hope that everyone remembers that it turns everything orange, including tears uh, and urine. Um, and um, you have to be careful about liver toxicity, especially people with chronic liver disease um, from uh, cirrhosis or, or other causes, uh, including hepatitis C. So. Uh, the point of this is that these are drugs that you can reliably take in the, or in the outpatient setting and get uh, a dose that's e essentially close to or equivalent to what you would get in the hospital uh, using intravenous um, delivery systems. Okay, let's switch now to resistance. Um, so uh, this is, of course, a growing public health problem, uh, and it's a global problem, uh, and I just want to go into the mechanisms by which bacteria uh, become resistant. And so um, the point here is that getting cultures and uh, obtaining sensitivities, uh, susceptibilities is important to help guide therapy uh, and uh, to make sure that you, uh, you pay attention to that, especially locally, because what's true in one uh, community is not necessarily true in another community with regards to resistance. So um, if you think about a bacteria that's trying to replicate and just basically make itself, um, that requires uh, that the bacteria will synthesize uh, components uh, uh, that uh, uh, it's made up of. And that includes um, aspects of the cell wall, nucleic acids, proteins, and the like. So that implies that the bacteria are metabolically active um, and that cell division requires them to be making stuff. So things that get in the way of making stuff uh, will disrupt cell division and, and therefore um, lead to at least, uh, at a minimum, uh, uh, no growth of organisms. And in, in many cases, um, the, that actually leads to uh, cell death um, or at least slowing the cell function. So here are the four mechanisms that organisms, um, of how organisms become resistant to antibiotics. Um, uh, and we're going to go through each of these in turn, um, but I'd like to actually use an analogy that might help you think about this. And the analogy that I, that I use uh, when I talk to patients about this is having a lock and a key. The key is the antibiotic. The lock is the target in the bacteria that the, that the key is trying to enter. Um, and so one way uh, uh, to basically not allow the key to work um, is by what's called enzyme inactivation. In other words, you break the key. You literally break the key in half. Then it won't work in the lock. Another way to do it is to change the lock. You alter the target site. A third way is you put some, basically some sort of layer, a membrane, um, a barrier around the lock. So the key, if it could get to the, to the slot, would, would, would work, but you've, you've covered it up so you can't, the key can't actually get into the area it needs to work. And that's typically seen when bacteria alter their bacterial cell membranes. And then finally, um, there's something called an antibiotic efflux pump. And what happens there is, is the key goes into the lock, uh, but then immediately gets, gets um, um, repulsed out, um, out, uh, out of the slot. Uh, and so all of these mechanisms, breaking the key, changing the lock, putting a barrier around the lock, and pumping it out, um, are, those are the four mechanisms. And now we're going to go into a little bit more detail about that. So here's an example of enzyme inactivation. Um, the classic one here are the beta-lactamases. These are enzymes that can inactivate um, uh, the drugs in the penicillin family, including the cephalosporins. And you can see that examples of that include homophilus influenzae, E. coli, uh, Klebsiella, and other enteric gram-negative rods, and of course, um, staphylococcal species. So uh, on the bottom left, you see a, the depiction of uh, a bacteria, that's the rectangle, and it produces these, the, the blue circles. Um, which uh, are the enzyme uh, 
uh, a beta-lactamase. And that beta-lactamase cleaves a bond um, in, um, uh, in the, the antibiotic. And by, by breaking that bond, um, then the organism, uh, or sorry, the, the antibiotic will not work. So the beta-lactamase um, opens the four-sided beta-lactam ring, and once that ring is broken, the antibiotic is inactivated. And this is how um, many organisms um, uh, become resistant, and you can see here as an example, um, there's different kinds of beta-lactamases. That's the column on the left, uh, and that um, by uh, their enzyme inactivation, uh, they can actually cause high levels of resistance. What you're seeing here, the numbers on the in the middle and right-hand column, uh, are the minimum inhibitory concentrations, or MITs, uh, to uh, different cephalosporins. And the point here is that the lower the number, the more likely the antibiotic is to work. The higher the number, the more resistance occurs. And so these different um, uh, plasmids um, uh, code for these uh, beta-lactamases, uh, and the organism basically is armed um, with these enzymes that, that break the key, um, in this case, beta-lactam antibiotics. So um, another uh, example uh, of the second, uh, or I say an example of the second mechanism, which is you know, changing the lock, is um, seen when you alter what are called penicillin binding proteins, or PDPs. Uh, these, what they really are, are transpeptidases. These are enzymes that essentially cross-link um, the uh, aspects of the cell wall and makes it, it makes it very much stronger. So um, uh, on the on the left side of this slide, you can see um, that there are these um, blue polygons uh, that um, um, represent these penicillin binding proteins, uh, and they produce cross-linking and make a very strong cell membrane and cell wall. And so in this example, this is Streptococcus pneumoniae or the pneumococcus, uh, and these uh, PDPs facilitate cell wall formation. And what happens is that penicillin can fit uh, right into that slot, and um, that basically causes the cell to be unable to make those crosslinks, and the, 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 mem the cell wall is therefore weakened, uh, and then the bacteria can die because of um, weakening of, of its um, outer coating. However, if the organism changes the locks, in other words, alters the shape of these penicillin binding proteins, then you can see the penicillin cannot dock or bind uh, to its, its binding protein, um, and therefore um, bacterial cell wall synthesis continues. And so the point here is that by altering the target site, uh, the bacteria can become uh, resistant. Another example of this is methylation. This occurs um, um, uh, at the ribosome. Um, and so uh, typically what happens is that macrolides like azithromycin will bind um, to, the, to the 50S ribosome, and so protein synthesis can be stopped. Um, uh, however, if you add a methyl group, that's the green circles, uh, to the ribosome, then the macrolide cannot bind to the ribosome. Um, and um, th um, that's an example of how the pneumococcus um, becomes resistant to um, uh, the macrolides, again, such as azithromycin and clarithromycin. So those were examples of um, uh, breaking, or sorry, of, of, of changing the lock. Now we're going to talk about putting a barrier around the lock, all right? And um, the bacteria, the concept of the bacteria can limit access to a site by virtue of the membrane characteristics. So anything that reduces permeability um, results in resistance, um, and um, the antibiotics that are affected include all the beta-lactams, again, penicillin and its cousins, uh, the self-antibiotics, and the quinolones. And so uh, examples of this are pseudomonas, um, the resistant and gram-negatives, and even um, uh, Neisseria gonorrhea, that they use this mechanism. They basically um, um, make it harder for the drug to penetrate through the cell membrane to hit its target. So here's a depiction of all three of the mechanisms we've talked about so far. Um, in this case, um, sometimes the antibiotics go through porins, uh, channels in the, in, the, in the membrane. Sometimes they go through the membrane itself. Anything that alters that um, uh, is basically putting a barrier around the target. Uh, then there are uh, the second, uh, or the mechanism that I first described, where the, these enzymes that 
um, alter uh, or are um, basically um, uh, change the antibiotic itself um, so the key is broken. And then finally, the target site you can change, uh, that's by changing the lock. So those are, again, the th three mechanisms depicted in one picture. And then the final mechanism um, is this efflux pump. And this is seen with um, many of the gram negatives. Uh, it's also seen with the pneumococcus. And then the antibiotics that are affected here are tetracyclines, quinolones, um, and macrolides. And the idea here is the antibiotic goes into the cell that is essentially uh, pumped out. It's, I think of like a, um, uh, you're in a rowboat with a small leak. If you, have a, if you can bail water faster than the water goes into the boat, you'll, you'll stay afloat. And that's essentially the concept here. So the point of all this is that there's that the, the organisms can become resistant. It's helpful to know the mechanism of that, and uh, it, therefore it's important to obtain cultures and susceptibilities to help guide your therapy. Okay, the next issue um, with uh, regards to criteria for selection of antibiotics, of course, is cost. The cost, not to the system, um, which is certainly an important part of stewardship, but I'm talking here primarily about a cost to the patient, the out-of-pocket cost, and so. Many health plans um, and um, uh, professional societies actually uh, have lists of you know three dollar drugs or five dollar drugs, um, and they can be very useful um, in making sure that the patients actually pick up their um, their prescriptions uh, from the pharmacy. Um, and so you can see here um, that there are uh, there's in this particular example there's a list of uh, four dollar drugs for thirty days and ten dollar drugs for ninety days. Um, and uh, such lists exist for many, many different kinds of, uh, of uh, pharmacologic agents. This particular list just happens to have um, the antibiotics. And you can see that um, some of the simple beta-lactams, or actually the old beta-lactams like amoxicillin, uh, cephalexin, uh, but even fluoroquinolones like cephalofloxacin, doxycycline, metronidazole, penicillin, sulfa, um, these are actually very inexpensive. Uh, and uh, that helps in terms of getting your patients to take the medicines. Um, another issue uh, is uh, the number of doses you have to take per day. And the rule of thumb is basically a once daily d drug is going to be, uh, is likely to be, uh, ha um, be related or um, promote um, better adherence than a drug that has to be taken multiple times a day. Uh, so taking a medication less frequently usually leads to better adherence. And here's some um, examples in the, from the antimicrobials. Uh, levofloxacin um, versus ciprofloxacin. Levo is given once a day, cipro is given uh, twice a day. Uh, so you're likely to be more adherent with levofloxacin. Same is true for valacyclovir, uh, which is a prodrug of acyclovir. Um, and azithromycin, uh, this, for example, this is for chlamydia. Um, azithromycin, a one-time dose uh, versus doxycycline, which you would have to take twice a day for seven days. And so the number of doses per day and even the duration of therapy, sometimes that's useful in helping uh, patients um, um, be, uh, adhere better to your plan and recommendations and something to consider. And then finally, of course, uh, is spectrum. So knowing which organisms um, are causing the infection that um, uh, will then lead you to prescribe better uh, and more accurately with regards to um, what you're dealing with. So, for example, um, aspiration pneumonia typically is caused by oral anaerobes that get into the lungs, um, and so you want to use an agent uh, that's active against the anaerobes. Um, so that would either be amoxicillin clavulanate. Um, the clavulanate is a beta-lactamase inhibitor that uh, basically allows um, uh, the uh, amoxicillin to work uh, even with that enzyme there, and um, that's a, a good drug for um, uh, aspiration pneumonia. Another uh, good drug there would be, of course, clindamycin. So the spectrum is important. Knowing the spectrum of the drug you're prescribing um, is obviously important for effective treatment, but it can also lead to less side effects. So, so we like to think in infectious diseases that narrower spectrum agents are generally much are, are generally preferred over broad spectrum agents. You want to be as narrow as you can. That minimizes um, the alteration of gut flora. It uh, um, generally means less side effects, and um, uh, it also uh, helps prevent um, opportunistic infections such as pseudomembranous colitis um, and vaginal yeast infections. And occasionally, 
um, it actually provides a clue to diagnosis. In other words, um, if you give a drug and the patient continues to have symptoms, um, you start thinking, what am I missing here? Because this drug is active against certain organisms, but not others. And I'm going to illustrate that by actually going into a case in a little bit of detail. So um, uh, this is a 32-year-old man who went camping on Long Island over Labor Day. Um, he developed fevers and, and muscle aches approximately one week uh, after his trip ended. And he says that he pulled several ticks off of his body while he was on vacation. The physical exam was significant only for a fever to 102 degrees. That's 102 degrees Fahrenheit. There was no rash. Um, and the labs showed um, that he had a thrombocytopenia of around 25,000. Um, a white, total white count was, I think, 3.5 or 3.2, something like that. And his transaminases were about 150 ALT, and uh, the AST also was elevated. So most of you are probably thinking, well, this is Lyme. Um, and sometimes Lyme can, uh, can occur even without a rash. Um, now, you know, most of the cases will have um, erythema migraines, uh, the, the classic bullseye rash uh, that you see with Lyme disease, but not every case. And so you can see the point of this slide is that uh, in the northern Midwest, um, as well as along the, the Atlantic seaboard in New England, um, there is, are a lot of cases of Lyme disease. And so um, using doxycycline, the drug of choice for Lyme disease, would make a lot of sense in this case. And, and in most situations, that's what you would think about, although the blood counts would, should suggest something else. Um, and that um, could be that maybe the patient has um, uh, anaplasmosis or ehrlichiosis. Now, the, the geography is not good here for ehrlichia. That's usually um, in uh, areas like Missouri, Arkansas, um, uh, Western Tennessee, uh, uh, that part of the country. But anaplasma can, uh, uh, does occur um, um, both in the Northeast as well as in the Upper Midwest. And um, it's transmitted by the exact same tick vector, the Izotes um, ticks, uh, deer ticks, uh, and they cause a granulos, uh, infection of granulocytes or, or neutrophils. So here is uh, the geographic distribution. Uh, and again, you see that um, uh, the, the northeastern part of the country and the upper Midwest are the areas most affected. So the same tick um, can transmit both anaplasma and Borrelia. Borrelia is the agent of Lyme disease. So um, uh, anaplasmosis um, and ehrlichiosis um, typically uh, start uh, uh, cause fever, headache, muscle aches, chills, cough, confusion, and abdominal pain. And um, it starts between three and 15 days after a tick bite. Uh, rash is rare and um, um, a subclinical infection uh, with moderate or mild symptoms is actually pretty common. And here you start seeing the low platelets the low white count and the elevated transaminases. So this picture is less likely due to Lyme and more likely due to anaplasma. Um, uh, and um, there's molecular ways of diagnosing this, is, but um, the one I like to use is just ask the lab techs, do you see what are called morula, this sort of um, blackberry or raspberry looking type um, um, uh, body within uh, the neutrophils? Well, it turns out that the patient continued to have symptoms. In other words, they didn't get better on doxycycline. And that was the whole point of this long story is that if you give a drug thinking that in this case it was anaplasma or Lyme and they kept being sick, you have to start thinking, well, what could it be that I'm missing? Um, and uh, in this case, it was actually a case of Babesia microti, Babesiosis. Uh, that was trans that's transmitted by ticks and it's seen again in the same areas. The, you know, the, uh, New England, um, the Mid-Atlantic states, and um, the Upper Midwest. Uh, an intracellular parasite that infects red blood cells. Uh, patients will present with a typical viral syndrome, fever, sweats, muscle aches, joint aches, anorexia, vomiting and fever, uh, sorry, vomiting and fatigue. Um, and um, what you can see is you can actually identify um, uh, organisms that kind of look like malaria, but they're not. This is Babesia um, inside red blood cells. And the, the classic one is this Maltese cross, which is shown in the upper right corner that can be seen in the RBCs. So this patient um, uh, uh, had babesiosis, and the trick or the clue was that he did not get better on doxycycline uh, because the treatment for babesia includes atovaquone and azithromycin. Um, and so again, um, 
think about the spectrum. And if someone's not getting better um, on your initial choice, think about something else that might be causing the problem. So co-infection can occur, um, and that's the point of this um, uh, sidebar. Okay, now going back to antibiotic selection, um, we've talked about a number of, of things to consider. Um, now there are now let's get a little bit more uh, sophisticated, more nuanced, if you will, um, and that involves pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics, and then issues around duration of therapy. So first, let me distinguish these two terms. Pharmacokinetics is basically um, focusing on what happens to the drug once a patient is administered the medication. How well is it absorbed? Um, what's its concentration? Where does it go? How long is it there? In contrast, pharmacodynamics focuses on what happens to the organisms once the medication gets to its target. In other words, how fast is the, is the action um, and what does it do relative to, to, to how long the drug is there? So pharmacokinetics is about basically molecules. Uh, pharmacodynamics is basically about bacteria. So um, this gets a little complicated, but hopefully you'll, you'll walk I'll walk you through uh, these curves uh, and, and more importantly, the concepts. So the concept um, that I'm trying to focus on for this slide is something called the time above the MIC. That's the time above the minimum inhibitory concentration. Um, and um, uh, what I'm talking about is how long the drug concentration at the site of where the organisms is is above the MIC. And it turns out that that's actually the best predictor for bacterial eradication when you're talking about labelactam antibiotics like penicillin and its cousins and the macrolides like azithromycin and its cousins. So what you're seeing on the graph here on the y-axis is serum concentration um, and it's a logarithmic scale. And the idea here is that um, uh, uh, when you dose a drug, you wrap uh, will rapidly get a rise in concentration, and at some point, in this case, um, at one microgram per milliliter, um, the concentration of the drug is above the MIC for that organism, in this case, um, Streptococcus pneumoniae. So the drug will then continue to rise as the full dose is absorbed and, and delivered to the site. And then, um, uh, it will start to wash out and be metabolized or eliminated from the body. So at this point, um, uh, depicted in the slide, somewhere around five hours after the, uh, uh, the, the drug concentration rose above the MIC, it falls um, below the MIC. Um, and then what happens then is for a while, um, then there is no drug concentration above the minimum inhibitory concentration. So, so think about that. You give a drug, it, the, it, it's, the concentration starts to go up, at some point it becomes effective, and then, it, then the drug goes, starts going away, and at some point the drug becomes ineffective. And so the question because, uh, that, uh, that um, I want you to focus on or think about is, well, what happens to the bacteria when the the concentration goes above the MIC, and then what happens to the bacteria when the concentration falls below the MIC? Well, um, you can, I think, uh, readily get to the point where, oh, you're gonna start killing organisms above the MIC, and as soon as you get below the MIC, you're gonna stop killing organisms. And so you get what, like basically a sawtooth curve, um, and, and the question is, when, it, when do you win? When are more organisms being killed than, than growing um, by through this action of intermittently dosing antibiotics. Well, it turns out that the magic number, you know, which is um, depicted in red font on the slide, is when the time above MIC is more equal to or greater than 40% of the dosing interval. In other words, the time the drug is above that magic MIC is more than 40% of, of the time between doses. When that happens, you get bacterial eradication and clinical response in a positive way. In other words, you get a cure. So the time above MIC is the important parameter determining the efficacy of beta-lactams. 
and in animal models, um, uh, serum levels of unbound, dro unbound drug need to exceed the MIC for at least 40% of the dosing interval to produce maximum survival. Um, and we see that um, in both acute otitis media and acute maxillary sinusitis for both H. flu and uh, the pneumococcus. And that's depicted on the next slide. In other words, 90% cure if you, if you have achieved time above MIC over 40. Um, so let me walk you through this slide. What you see first are um, um, the blue circles, um, or still, the circles are cases of acute otitis media. The squares are cases of acute bacterial sinusitis. The pink are uh, pneumococcus, and the blue um, is homophilus influenzae. And what you're seeing here is um, on the y-axis um, is actually the percentage of time above the MIC. And on the x-axis um, is, um, oh, sorry, the other way around. Uh, on the, on the y-axis um, is um, efficacy, um, how, um, uh, what's the percentage of cure that you're achieving? Um, on the y-axis, and 90% is right here, right, um, uh, uh, right where the, the curve plateaus. On the x-axis uh, is uh, the uh, time up of MIC, and it turns out that uh, the second tick mark, or the, the third tick mark, um, is where uh, you achieve 40%. So when the concentration um, of the drug is 40% of the MIC, that's where the curve plateaus. So all the, the dots and squares in the upper right, that's clinical cure over 90%, uh, and um, it, they, that only occurs when, it, when the MIC exceeds 40% of the dosing interval. So the, just, to, just keep thinking of that number 40. If it's above 40, but, um, uh, or 40, of above, 40 or above, you get a cure. If it's below 40, you don't get a cure. So now what you're seeing here is different antibiotics with different regimens, and um, you have three kinds of pneumococcus. Susceptible to penicillin is the first column. Intermediately susceptible to penicillin is the middle column, and resistant to penicillin is the right-hand column. And what you're seeing is that if it's fully susceptible organism, all the antibiotics work. But if you're dealing with a resistant organism, then um, the cephalosporins actually don't work very well. And that's why we don't use cephalosporins by and large um, uh, when you have resistant uh, cases of, of ear infections and sinus infections. Um, and here it is for homophilus influenzae. Amoxicillin works pretty well. Cephpodoxin works okay. Cephtonir works okay, but the other ones don't. So the point being here is that you can actually, by knowing this, you can actually better prescribe. Um, so uh, what's the punchline here? Um, that it's really important for the patients to take all the doses that are prescribed um, in, and in the right timing. So if it's a two, twice a day, there's a reason why it's twice a day, um, and um, the, the patient needs to adhere to that. If it's once a day, based upon the, the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, uh, then, then that's fine. But the point here is the drugs should be taken as prescribed, and that certain drugs, in this case amoxicillin, is, is, will be better, especially for dealing with resistant organisms. Now, in contrast to um, time above MIC, a different pharmacodynamic parameter is something called the area under the curve. And what you're dealing with here is basically the total amount of drug um, over time, uh, so the area under the curve. And the parameter that matters here is when you take that number, the area under the curve, and you divide it by the, the MIC, that it turns out that that's the best parameter when you're talking about the fluoroquinolones or the tetracycline antibiotics, um, and that's shown here. So the efficacy against the pneumococcus, streptococcus pneumoniae, um, for different fluoroquinolones is when you basically have an AUC over MIC that's greater than 25. And if you look at the far right column, what you'll see here is that both levofloxacin and moxifloxacin have an MIC, oh, sorry, have an AUC over MIC over 25. In other words, levofloxacin and moxifloxacin will work against streptococcus pneumoniae. In contrast, ciprofloxacin um, does not have an, MI, an AUC over MIC over 25, 
And that's why ciprofloxacin is not a good drug for pneumococcal infections. It's because of this parameter. So certain fluoroquinolones are called respiratory fluoroquinolones. They're the ones that are used for community-acquired pneumonia, Levo and Moxie. Cipro, in contrast, is not useful for that um, if you're dealing with strep pneumo. So that was pharmacodynamics. Now a little bit about pharmacokinetics. In this case, um, what you're dealing here is the, MI, is the MIC is important, and you want to get a concentration that's at least that high. And you can see here that for um, um, Pseudomonas, the, um, it was, uh, that um, ciprofloxacin um, has the lowest MIC. In other words, it's the one that's more easily obtained, and so the lower number here is, is, is better, and that ciprofloxacin is the only fluoroquinolone um, against, uh, that you would want to use for Pseudomonas originosa. And then finally, um, there's the issue of metabolism. And here I'm contrasting two fluoroquinolones, levofloxacin and moxifloxacin, uh, and you see different parameters that are associated with them, but I want you to focus just on the very bottom row, the R and the H. So when I use levo versus moxy, what I'm thinking about is, is there, is there some sort of metabolic problem with the patient that the patient has um, with regards to elimination? And the R stands for renal, and the H stands for hepatic. How do I use this in practice? If a patient has chronic kidney disease, all right, um, so um, I do not want to use levofloxacin because I worry about it's, um, that, it, that it's going to potentially um, uh, have trouble with dosing. However, in contrast, if someone has liver disease, then I don't want to use moxifloxacin because that's hepatically cleared. So in patients with liver disease, use levofloxacin. In patients with kidney disease, use moxifloxacin. And then finally, um, the last characteristic or, or criteria that I want you to think about is the duration of therapy. And here I think we have very good news that I want to share with you. And that is that um, we are now um, getting better and better data and evidence that we don't have to use long durations of therapy for most outpatient infections. Um, so we've seen uh, that randomized, there are randomized controlled trials that uh, show that for community-acquired pneumonia, five days is just as good as, long as 10 to 14 days. In fact, for ventilator pneumonia, you only have to use eight days of therapy. For cellulitis, five days is just as good as 10 days. For intra-abdominal infections, seven days is the maximum. And pyelonephritis, um, one week is just as good as two weeks. So let's go through a few of these in turn. So for community-acquired community pneumonia, we now have um, evidence that there are uh, from five randomized trials that have shown that five days of treatment have the same outcomes as longer duration for the beta-lactams, the quinolones, and the macrolides. Um, there's two meta-analysis, and they've shown that less than or equal to seven days of treatment was equivalent to longer courses. And so the, um, the uh, guidelines from the Infectious Disease Society of America basically say if a community-acquired pneumonia in the outpatient setting, all you need, and even in the inpatient setting, actually, all you need is five days of treatment as long as uh, the temperature has normalized, um, the heart rate is normal, the respiratory rate is normal, um, the systolic blood pressure is normal, and their oxygen saturation is above 90%, and they have a normal mental status exam. Once these have occurred, in other words, once the vitals have normalized, just go five days. So most will get five days, a few people will get a, a day or two extra um, um, based upon when normalization occurs. The exception to that short course therapy um, is when you have bacteremia from Staph aureus, when um, the, 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 um, there's an empyema, uh, or uh, if there's an abscess, or, or if we're dealing with Legionella. But for most cases of community-acquired pneumonia, five days is sufficient, or five days from when normalization of, of vitals has occurred. Skin and soft tissue, a couple of points about this first. Cellulitis is never bilateral. It's always one leg or one arm. It's almost always due to strep, not staph. So strep pyogenes or group A strep is, the, is by far the most important organism that causes cellulitis. And very importantly, the redness, the erythema, will continue to advance for several days because the bacteria are being killed and they release, what, they release what's called an erythrotoxin. So if the symptoms such as fever, pain, swelling improve, 
but the redness continues, that is actually a success and not a failure. Let me say that again. Expansion of the of, of redness, more erythema, is not necessarily bad and is actually predicted. What you're looking for are things like, is the white count better? Is the, um, is the fever gone? That's what you're looking for. And there's very good evidence that five days is just as good as 10 days. Um, and the Infectious Disease Society of America recommends seven days of treatment for cellulitis for uncomplicated infections. Uh, for intra-abdominal infections, um, uh, retrospective studies show that uh, seven days or less was equal to longer duration. And in fact, there's a randomized trial underway that's looking at um, three to five days versus two days once um, uh, GI function has normalized, uh, the, the fever is resolved, and the white counts are, uh, have improved. The current recommendation from the Infectious Disease Society of America is four to seven days as long as source control has been achieved. And so you'll be seeing patients um, that were hospitalized for acute appendicitis, uh, and um, if the contamination in the OR, uh, oh, sorry, from, if the contamination occurred, meaning um, uh, rupture of the appendix, was um, less than 24 hours to when the surgery occurred, um, uh, uh, that's considered good source control. And the other issue here is we no longer have to use antibiotics for necrotizing pancreatitis. So um, this is, you probably won't see most of these patients in the outpatient setting, but the point here is that less is just as good as longer for most, most infections. Pyelonephritis, um, eight randomized trials show that um, 14 days was equal to six weeks for ampicillin or sulfa. One week was just as good as two weeks for the fluoroquinolones. Um, and so the recommendations uh, from 2011 are basically five to seven days of therapy for pyelonephritis. But remember what I said earlier, avoid um, uh, the minerals, the divalent cations, uh, when you're using an oral fluoroquinolone. So in summary, when you're prescribing outpatient antibiotics, be wise. Think about the drugs that penetrate and absorb well. Um, make sure that you're familiar with the resistance patterns in your community and, um, and when needed, obtain a culture and susceptibilities. Think about the cost of the patient, use those inexpensive drugs. Try to use drugs that are given less times per day that will improve adherence. Remember the spectrum is important. Um, for more, um, uh, if you really want to get into this, then um, uh, we, in fact, we ID specialists like to think about um, what the drug is doing and what's happening to the organisms. And the most important thing there is to tell the patients, take the doses as prescribed because um, they have been formulated in a way to optimize pharmacodynamics. In terms of duration of therapy, shorter is better. Uh, shorter, shorter, I should say, is just as good as longer. And so we're more and more indications for using short therapy. And then finally, um, is there benefit? Um, and that basically means uh, distinguish infection from non-infection. Uh, uh, and that's important, of course, clinically to do. So thank you very much. I hope that this was beneficial to you um, and um, appreciate your uh, time. Have a great day.